in creating, revealing stories. In fact, we are standing in a place that is so full of stories. Um, many of you might know that this was a uh, hall uh, where there were dancers um, from the 1930s to the 1950s, and a lot of locals met their, their husband or wife in this very place. And that is really um, the, the sort of intention of our Revealing Stories project. Uh, David and I have known each other for many years, and we came together to work on what we consider to be a creative history project, where the words and the photography uh, have equal weight. And the work isn't a complete story of all of these places, and uh, we're really looking forward to, to sharing these uh, stories with you tonight. Um, Revealing the Stories was the pilot project of the Brunswick Design Group, a uh, design architect, and it would not have been possible without the owners of the theatres and the venues that we visited. They were incredibly generous in letting us into these places. And also, especially thanks to the Brunswick History Group, to the COVID Historical Society and the World Historical Society, who really generously share their knowledge, collections um, with me in particular that, that helped me understand the history of these, these places and incredible places in our neighbourhood. So why did we do this project? Um, one part of it was to document the changes that are going on in our neighbourhood. Um, there's a lot of development, there's a lot of change going on and Diane and I really wanted to have the chance to go into these hidden places and document these stories while they're, they're here. Um, so uh, there was sort of a record, I suppose, of, of all of these places. In fact, when we started, um, it was really just the end of COVID. And so a lot of the places that we spoke to and visited were just coming off the back of being closed and all the challenges associated with reopening after COVID-19. The other thing that we wanted to do was to look at multiple perspectives. So um, the whole idea of bringing multiple voices um, to play. So we wanted to speak to the owners of these venues and talk to them about what does it mean to work in a historic community or place. Um, also to um, look at the history of some of these places. Um, and for Joanna and I to have our own personal reflections of of walking into these really just incredible places and we'll see them um, in a minute. And also uh, what we did was look at history in situ. That was that we didn't go into any of these places, move things around, set, I mean we did set things up, but what we'll see is what we found when we walked into these um, theatres and venues. Um, which I think sort of adds to their, their wonder. <laughs> so the first place that we're going to look at is the Tarsen Hull Room, which uh, is in the Bates building in uh, Sydney Road. We arrived at 9.30 a.m. and on the ground floor of the Taj Mahal ball and, uh, Ballroom is the Happy Living Homeware and Partyware Shop. And um, the owners were incredibly uh, generous. We went up a staircase and there it was. So for each of them, I'm just going to do a little history. Um, just tell you a little, little, bit, little bit about them. And then Diana's going to talk about the, the visual aspects of what we found. So this, uh, the building was built by uh, someone called uh, an architect called Sidney Herbert Wilson for a guy called Kim John Bates. And it's a really, if any of you have been up there, it's a very imposing double story building. Um, and when it opened, there were two shops on the ground floor, there was a pathway down the back into a livery stable. And he was a furniture linguist and carrier. But he, what was interesting about what he did was he built a really large open space upstairs, um, which was really quite 
quite unusual at that time, and it's spanned by this metal portal frame and a tubular roof. And we think it was probably designed as a roller skating rink, but it was very short lived. And after that, he actually rented the space out to a hosiery factory and then used it to store his furniture. He then sold the building in 1920 to Mary Mitchell, who was the wife of the Coburg town clerk, and it became a billiard hall in the 1920s and then a physical culture school, and then the Taj Mahal Ballroom opened in 1932. It featured the latest decor. And what we, what we found upstairs was uh, a stage with the singing march and murals on the walls. And hundreds of dancers were entertained by an orchestra uh, with a drummer called Tom Saunders who sang jazz age numbers such as I'm a, a ding dong daddy and, and things like that. Um, there were already going into a rug, smoking stands, large arm, arm chairs and drapery. And a quote from a newspaper of the day says, the whole scene gave the impression of a sunken garden from which stretched lovely gardens of palms and bright hued exotic flowers glowing warmly under a canopy of stars. So I'll just tell you a bit about what I was trying to, you know, um, the angle I was taking when I was looking for, for what photographs to take. Mm. And I suppose I was really looking to capture aspects of the spaces described in these layers of time and history. And I was looking for a sense of the human presence in the spaces and any contemporary references about place in Brunswick and COVID, where they were actually situated. Um, so when we um, look at the Taj Mahal, Mahal Ballroom, I suppose, um, just firstly, what struck me about a recent um, documentary film I saw called The Lost City of Melbourne, I assume some of you might have seen that, which charts the destructive period of Melbourne's architectural history from 1956 to the 70s was how many performing arts and picture theatres once existed in the Brunswick and Coburg district, and like, where are they all now? <laughs> um, and Gus Berger, director of the film, said in an interview with the Australian Design Review, and I quote, I think what made me special was the motivation on behalf of the architects to create a space that would mirror the experience that people are going to have once they go inside these places. So you're creating a kind of artificial dreamlike escapist experience for people. Um, and I think Janine and I experienced this dreamlike escapism at the Taj Mahal immediately in Sydney Road, Coburg, and the 90-year-old painted murals depicting the Taj Mahal from India. And um, the pyramids and date palms from Egypt, known in the 19th century as Orientalism, were incredibly striking on the walls and the bandstand at the stage. And the stage for me was really interesting. It was incredibly difficult to photograph because it was so dark and confined space. It was actually a false wall put in um, to separate it from the rest of the space. Uh, the graffiti, I hope you can see it, um, was, was scratched onto the um, back, back mural. And there was lots of pop marks with you know, impact holes and the, um, some of them were stuff with horse hair and there was the chalk marks and objects pinned onto the woodwork as for this picture here. But I also like the way that the happy living party and homeware shop um, downstairs have placed everyday baskets and these containers around the sides of the stage taking the place of the musicians in the stage which in a sense which had once been on the stage. Um, this one last shot. Yes, and this is from the room. That's the mural that's on the walls mm -hmm. um, remaining from the Taj Mahal Ballroom. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So it was a one, one, wondrous place. We really had a sense of all the people who danced on that floor. We went up there. 
The next place that we looked at was the Progress Theatre. Um, we ran our state program on Friday at 11am and we met Sarah, um, who's the ballet uh, teacher at the uh, Progress uh, Theatre. And it was really special because I'd always wanted to go in there. I, I lived in the neighbourhood and walked past it and really always wanted to go and have a look at it. Um, and it's full of layers of history um, when you go in there. It's, and standing on the stage, which you'll see shortly, and looking back at that audience and all the seats, just again, just recall more people who had a great time in the um, Progress Theatre. So it was actually built by the West Coburg Pro Progress Association, who borrowed money to build it, um, to build a community hall. And if you go down the side of um, the progress there, you'll see the community hall. And what you're looking at here is a, a facade with some shops um, that, that were built in 1927. So it's a, a really art, sort of modern uh, facade with the shops, and behind it you can actually see the shape of the, the original hall there. Um, it hosted uh, dances, bazaars, and concerts. Um, and then the Progress Association decided to lease it out to um, cinema operators in 1927 to someone called Rosie Blackwood, um, who actually continued to show uh, pictures at the Progress Theatre up until 1944. And that was followed by a number of other cinema operators. Uh, and some of you may have been to the Progress to see a film. Um, I wish I had a chance to, to actually see a film in the progress. Um, um, and the progress continued to operate as a cinema up until 1998. So quite recently, really. Um, and during that time, there were a number of cinema operators, uh, some of whom you probably know if you actually went to see the films of the. Uh, progress, they were Tom Pearson, Frank Nunn and Harold Davidson, David Earl and Eric Ray in the 1980s and 90s, and finally John Freeman. And the second film, Death in Brunswick, is actually a second film in, in cinema, and that was at the progress, and that was part of the progress um, theatre. And the quote that I found. Um, sort of sums up the progress really. Um, many locals went to the progress as kids and um, uh, uh, someone who was on Jane, John Fane's program said, I would spend almost every Saturday afternoon at the flea house watching the weekly matinee. That usually consisted of a Mary Mellon's cartoon and Fred Sturgis, short and a somewhat dated feature movie. The whole theatre was a riot of noise. The lights going down changed nothing. Children raced up and down the aisles, constantly swapped seats, and talked very loudly. So when I rounded the corner of the Progress Theatre in Kyberg with my camera, the first thing I noticed was this fantastic shadow of the Road generated from the word progress uh, in this beautiful art modern Bethlehem signage. So the building, as Janine said, was operated originally as a community hall in 1923, those years. And however, the signage would have been erected later in 1938 when the architect A.G. Headley modernised the building. So Art Modern was a, an influential typographic and architectural style that thrived during the 30s and 40s. But for me, the shadow on the road was also a connection with black and white film noir style photography from a genre of Hollywood uh, thriller or crime movies that were popular in the 40s and 50s. Uh, the dramatic shadows cast by strong lighting helps to create a mysterious effect. But the difference, of course, was I was working in colour and in broad daylight, but the clouds and electric, electric cables, I thought, created a fabulous atmosphere in the way they shot, and the cars were reflected in the glass windows and the housing in the side street. It's really set, it, it, this is a space in suburbia, like in a suburban street, 
rather than the main road, which I think is really fabulous about this space. Mm -hmm. One to all you just happen to sit there in the middle of nowhere. Um, I'll just speak briefly about the ballet um, sign on the wall. It's apparently the current owner or um, the father installed this window because it's now a ballet school, so it's a beautiful um, window which is great. It's the place still keeps evolving and changing depending on what its usage is. I'm going to the stage with the front of the front of the stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the next place uh, that we went to was uh, probably the most unusual um, place, which was it used to be the Alhambra Theatre, um, and it's now stuck in Thai service. Um, up in uh, Sydney Road, the Gate in Brunswick, um, and we were there on Friday afternoon. And uh, I just love this place. I think this is so surprising to go past all of these tyres. You know, see photos of these, and there remained evidence that, that it had been a playhouse, it had been a cinema. You can see some photos of that. So it opened um, in 1914, and it's the brainchild of someone called Percy Allen, a local builder, who had harbored dreams of owning his own theatre. So he designed, managed, and promoted it as a sort of one man band operation. It was known as the Flea Pit. And it wasn't a fancy place at all. Um, what's interesting is that, we, that it was constructed of reinforced concrete, which was very unusual, uh, and had a corrugated iron roof. You'll see photos of that, uh, which caused an absolute fear when, when the film was playing and it might have been raining and it was incredibly hot in there. And this is um, the proscenium. Mm -hmm. Even it's the, the stage, the films mm -hmm. were shown here. Mm -hmm. Just extraordinary. Uh, again, to just walk into this place and here, here's our, our theatre history. Uh, fortunately, 11 months after opening, uh, Percy got himself into trouble with the city of Brunswick health inspectors <laughs> and was pros uh, prosecuted for failing to keep the premises of the theatre in a state of cleanliness so as not to be a nuisance to the public. So you can only imagine the kind of, well, yes. Yeah, the flea pit, basically. And you can see the, the roof, the, the original uh, struts are still, still up there. Um, he programmed silent movie romances and comedies, featuring actors of the day, like Lenny and Nick, Charlie Chaplin, um, starring in the movies and very much more dramatic titles. So his dream of the cinema came to an end. His dream as an owner came to an end after two years when it was taken over by a cinema network for change. It continued to show films, believe it or not, until 1959, um, when all around them were, you know, as had happened in the 1920s and 30s, amazing. Um, and very glamorous things like the uh, Padua, the Art Deco Padua on Sydney Road that sadly got um, demolished. Um, then Hoyt's closed it down. It became uh, uh, an ice skating rink and a car sales room. And in 1988, it became the headquarters of Stuffy Tire Service. And Stuffy Tire Service goes back. Um, a long time. Um, they were established in Flemington in, in 1966, and the, as the business grew, they relocated to another premises in Sydney Road before coming to um, this building that was the Alhambra Theatre. Mm -hmm. um, this is me. Rights in the text, it really was like stepping back in time at the old Columbia Theatre. Um, and looking up at that vast ceiling with its roof trusses and once operational with retractable roof um, really just had this incredible aura about it. And it was really grand, jam packed, you know, like a rabbit warren in there with so many rows of tyres and um, you know, track pole. You know, had to kind of watch where you were sitting because it was, <laughs> it was perfectly safe, but it wasn't going to be. Speaking, had a slightly old world feel about it. 
Uh, and that amazing painted stage and the peeling um, paint on the timber and the deck that was created by the speaker, the light coming through the back of the stage, um, must have been the light wall behind it. So um, it was quite an interesting, quite difficult space to photograph, but extremely interesting. And uh, I think for me, again, the tiles and all those little boxes kind of replaced they're always there on the stage, you know, there's, there's spaces like, like replacing the seats or the, the human presence of them. So um, that was fabulous. And I think this fabulous uh, cardboard cut out of it, I think it's a motorcycle way to go. Mixed wood. Mixed wood. Mixed wood, yeah. What year? Um, he was gone free, so I don't know. Gone free. No. Now, but I think, yeah. <laughs> Great, because we were the other day just trying to okay, who is he? I sort of had a sense he was nose for, but mm. thank you. Has got the name of the company on the bottom of the shirt looking at the fields and the gill that probably It was just sort of also finding these unusual things, mm. um, juxtaposing what had been mm. the Alhambra. <laughs> Incredible. Mm. But it was interesting the one that was called the flea piece or flea thing. Mm. The flea house. Yeah. It must have been an awful lot of flea. And it was closed down for a while because, it was, it, was, yeah. because it was unhygienic. So you can imagine actually this looks kind of pretty grumpy because it's a tire so I can't doubt that it's kind of a huge mark there. The next place we visited was the West of Egypt, yes. in the Royal which is now um, Estonian or Esto House. Mm. And we met there on a Friday afternoon uh, and met. Um, Matt, Matt, sorry, we met Matt, um, who was just so enthusiastic, uh, showing us every corner of the place. And the reason why. Um, we were interested in this was because it was very much a sort of story of migration. Um, it, uh, it was had been a Marco Polo cinema, um, an Italian cinema, uh, and now it was a Estonian house. And when um, we walked through it, Estonian culture was absolutely embedded everywhere. Mm -hmm. Artworks, um, parks, um, the stage, as mm -hmm. you can see here, which uh, with the backdrop by um, an artist called um, Gunnar Nina, and there are a lot of his murals around the Stonian House. Mm. Um, the Western Theatre was built and opened in 1928 by someone called Thomas Gladstone Dowsley, who was a local businessman and later president of the authorised news agents of Victoria. So some of these places were established by people with really unusual kind of backgrounds. They weren't necessarily theatre folk taking this uh, risk to be building these places, but they probably saw an opportunity. Um, it was set on an elevated position from Melbourne Road, um, and the new West Coburg tram line opened, opened out the front, around the time um, this uh, theatre opened. Um, and the Union Theatre made a great Union west of um, So a whole lot of major cinema chains got involved in some of these cinemas in particular in our, in our area in Coburg and, and Brunswick and took them over. Initially they, they screened silent movies and then popular fare of the day, uh, films like Naughty Marietta uh, and also vaudeville acts and performances including one of the seasons by Australia's Queen of Song, Gladys Concrete. So there are actually live performances um, in, this, in this place. Um, and in 1970, it became uh, the Marco Polo Italian Cinema, uh, which screened Italian films like These Mad Bad Italians, Ben Hur, and Toto of Arabia. Um, and what uh, we were told was that if you go into the, the, the foyer of the, um, the theatre, um, there's terrazzo floor there, and that was installed by the Italian, um, you know, the Italian cinema, was there. it's beautiful. Um, and the Australian community purchased the Western Theatre in 1971 and it's turned all the rooms into community spaces for the Australian community. 
I have to say that this thing is a really interesting time in its history because Nat told us that sadly the Estonian community um, isn't as big as it used to be and this place has become much too large for the community. So we're not quite sure what's going to happen, um, but there, I think there are some thoughts about perhaps, um, perhaps some of this. So let's hope it um, goes to um, somebody who's going to love it and I can make it available to the community in some way. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's available now anyway. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, I was there about um, three or four weeks ago when they had the multicultural concert. Oh, fantastic. Mm. And um, so it's, it's rented out by different, um, besides the tool, you know, rentals and use, and I think it gets used around a couple of yeah. times a month. It's yeah. great, isn't it? That when we were there, they were setting up for, the, um, for a big function mm. that night. Yes, for me, um, the art, the craft, the Estonian culture, the Prince of Community was really strong in this building. Um, there was a lot to capture. Um, the mural on the stage depicting the Estonian choir by um, Gunnar Lee, the artist. And above the door of the kitchen, the starburst star clock made by the jeweller Oswald Holzman was fantastic. Mm. It was a craft of work. Mm. And there's enough painting there, I'm not quite sure what that was that mm. painted that. But um, um, I adored the seats in the mm. circle. Mm. That's mm. it. I, um, I, I, I couldn't help but thinking because of the beautiful cracks in the vinyl that many a bottle sat on those seats <laughs> and they, they are you know, 19 years old and they are lucky and there's a lot of cracks and I don't think particularly comfortable. But they had that wonderful stencil numbering system on them. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing that they are still there after mm -hmm. 90 years, just mm -hmm. like these gorgeous um, reminders of the past. Mm -hmm. uh, so it hasn't really changed. It's mm -hmm. it's it's a bit of all, has it? That's what you can get yeah. part of this. It's so you're so walking in, it's really stepping back in time. Mm -hmm. um, um, upstairs, there are still sort of art deco ceilings. And it's just beautiful. But I think my favourite thing in the whole building was this, it was pots and pots of stone, but I just loved the aluminium pots because, and the kitchen, because it really speaks to the essence of the community. And even though there was no one really there on the day we were there, you could feel it everywhere that the community really loved this place and used it a lot. And I also loved the COVID 19 announcements stuck on the walls because it also set the Time I think when it looks back on these photographs one day, I was going to see them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, all those things stuck there, and you know, mm -hmm. to remind us to stay apart, which we didn't have to do that day. I also think that's kind of setting it in here and now, mm -hmm. um, and they'll be gone, you know, um, soon too. Mm -hmm. The last place that we visited was the Brunswick Hall. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to go uh, to a contemporary place and see yeah. how the historic community was being used for um, the concerts, uh, comedy nights uh, by, the, by the community in the present day. Uh, so we were there on a Friday night when they were doing a uh, sound check. And so it was really great to be there with all the team rushing around, setting up tables, and really being part of the living, breathing uh, So. This, um, this, uh, the, the upstairs were about to show you these once dwelling rooms for shop, the shopkeepers below. Uh, they might have been, they were uh, boot makers and saddlers, uh, tea smiths and plumbers. So on the ground level, they were the businesses uh, there. And up until the 1920s and 30s, the space was most likely used as work rooms. Thank you for your research. For uh, designing, cutting, and manufacturing dresses to textiles and milliners. Um, and John, um, John Aspel, Aspel Larkos has run and leased the building for various purposes for quite a while, including the dining room, nightclub and bar, the reception hall and the Metropolis 
dying uh, hall. And in, 19, in 2010, he installed these amazing lights on the ceiling that are based on the Leonard French um, ceiling in the National Gallery of Victoria. So we've got a little, little bit of uh, Leonard French um, in Sydney Road. And that, that was beautiful, the light coming from those. Um, it was a spot of Mallard in 2012 until it closed um, in February uh, 2022 as the COVID wave arrived. So uh, that was a real impact of, as I said at the beginning, we were starting to sort of see all these things sort of returning after, after the impact of COVID. It opened as a Brunswick Ballroom in 2021 and it was based on um, a great venue down in Tehran called the Continental Cafe that closed, that also had um, musicians and comedy arts and uh, it was a terrific venue. We were lucky to meet Will Ewing, who is the, the venue director. Um, and as I said at the beginning, we really wanted to talk to the owners about what these places mean. Some were more able to articulate it than others. Um, and Will told me that he's a, got an enormous pride in the story and its connection to history uh, by being in the building and a sense of responsibility for the legacy of the building and the local community. So the Brunswick uh, Brun Forum is a great place to sort of end our journey really as an exploration to the five venues that we chose as part of this pilot project. I think for me this place being so dark and colourful, but yet alive, it had that atmosphere of, you know, way back when I was in some bands and <laughs> things like, I still do occasionally, but it brought me back to that sort of world of music and fun, and even though we were, we were always there before the action was about to happen in some of these places, but it was really great to, to have somewhere that was, see somewhere that was alive and well, and not that the other places weren't alive and well, but you could get a kind of sense that with the nostalgia that, and you know that these places may not be around for, for too long, but this was um, a really refreshing change and I adored the, the glass dome windows, I thought they really made the place not just fabulous that they, they put them in, didn't they? Yeah, yeah they did, but they went to that effort to give that, that new thing. Oh, they were put in ages ago. They were put in when I got married in, ni in the 1990s. It was there. So I've got photos of it. There. It was a wedding reception. Oh. It was used as a Greek wedding reception. Oh, because I don't know what it that, that was still there because I've got it. So that was put in the 90s. Well, before, well, before the, at least before 92. Okay, no, no, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not photos of it. Yeah, that's great. That's and I think it's sort of coming up by the like, overall. It was a lot of fun. Um, we had a terrific time meeting um, all of the, the amazing um, owners and people who were looking after these uh, places for us um, and for our local community. And um, we're really pleased that we've got a, a, another opportunity, a, a grant to do a, the same thing in Geelong. Mm. And so um, we learn a lot um, from, from doing a pilot project. Um, one of which was not really, Diana had a chance to do a rec, you know, a rec reconnaissance, so I just say, oh, I'm meeting at the Progress Theatre and Diana will rock up with the camera gear and, you know, so this next project is going to be a Well, for me, my background was actually uh, photographing landscape out in the afternoon, so it was quite challenging for me to enter these really dark spaces and I had Mm. Uh, I don't know some lighting, I had some lighting experience, but we decided to just use intelligent light so I can have the shutter open to walk on the tripod and say, I think the one space is up for a minute, which is not great with a digital camera, but I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> That's why that um, man really is mm. mm. But um, mm. I found it quite challenging for me because it's a bit of a part of what I normally do, but it was really rewarding. To design again, I've been here for 18 years. No idea that these places existed. So, for me, as a visual person, it was extremely rewarding. So, uh, could anyone else have to know? So, they were a part of the numbers. One was who actually painted the mural in the Taj Mahal ballroom. I couldn't find that out. Um, 
Another one was who ran the Marco Polo Cinema. Um, couldn't get to the bottom of that. In fact, I contacted you know, if anyone remember, the football one. Yes. Uh, contacted an Eastern football player because the surname was the same as a Western football player. There was no connection. So there was a few things that we just couldn't, couldn't discover. But I think they're really important and it's great for, the, for us to Thank you. 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 The decades of cinema's explosion, you mentioned that in your data for some of the cinemas, and you may know that the um, Prime Minister, Sandy Bruce, who was a great patrician, and another abstraction of style, wrote a role of work, had the lecture down and sang it on the cinemas. He was very savage about cinemas, and he thought that was being treated. He, he saw that it was in fact phenomenal, and he, um, he and his wife first wrote Shakespeare, and he was very intolerant of what he had seen. And uh, in 1939, when the government started to make a tremendous deficit, he decided to do some campaign attacks in the whole cinema and three years to mobilise the bank system, which is to be one of the reasons why he lost the